Good morning. I think it was 2018 I was here last, which is an awful long time ago. Before I start the service this morning, the Methodist Church has put um, a statement on its website and a prayer. I'm going to read the statement, first of all, um, written by the President and the Vice President of the Methodist Conference. <clears throat> The President and Vice President of the Methodist Conference have made the following statement in response to the announcement of the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It was with profound sadness that we learned of the death of Her Majesty the Queen today. We join the nation in grief and thank God for her long and distinguished reign. The loyalty to and the love expressed for Queen Elizabeth across the world is a testament to the life that she led, one marked by dedicated service to others. She provided encouragement and reassurance to a world living through uncertain times. For people of all ages, the Queen has provided constancy, a calm and wise influence at all levels of society. Our nation, the Commonwealth and the world have been greatly blessed by her life and work. We give thanks to God that her duty as monarch was grounded in a deep faith in Jesus Christ, which has been an inspiration to countless people throughout her reign. Her dedication, commitment and service to her people will never be forgotten and will sustain all those who mourn in the coming weeks. Our prayers are for her family who have lost a mother, grandmother, great-grandmother and aunt. And we pray that all may be inspired by her service and guided by her example. The prayers of the Methodist people are also offered for His Majesty, the King, in his new role. They've also published a prayer, which I thought we might like to say together. And perhaps you might, if you're able, like to stand as we say this prayer which is going to be on the, it is on the screen, thank you. After the prayer, I'll just allow a couple of minutes before we sit back down. And if you're needing to sit down, sit, please. Um, just for you to remember, as you've probably been, been remembering over the last few days. So we pray. Creator God, we give thanks for the life of the most gracious majesty. Queen Elizabeth II, one of her life's service, built on the firm foundation of her faith and an exemplary commitment to duty. Comfort those who mourn and bring peace to those in distress. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Long live the king. <laughs> Those are um, words we probably will get familiar with now, and we are going to sing the national anthem at the end of the service. I'm starting with Psalm 51, which is the lectionary psalm for today, verses 1 to 10. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
for I know my transgressions and my sins always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear, hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So let us come and shout praises to God and raise the roof for the God who saved us. Let us march into his presence singing praise, lifting the rafters with our songs. Why? Why should we do that? Because God is the best. And surely our Queen showed us that. And what an inspiration that was, that sign, as we learn to her death, the double rainbow over Buckingham Palace, the sign in the sky. We're going to start singing this morning with hymn number 58 from Singing the Faith. Lord, I come before your throne of grace, number 58.
now we come to a time of prayer. Let us pray. First of all, a prayer of confession. Oh God, when we have closed doors where we should have opened them, forgive us. When we've stayed in a box where we're called to break out, forgive us. When we have bubble wrapped ourselves so thoroughly that we can't even perceive what's outside our experience, forgive us. When we have been gatekeepers instead of welcomers, forgive us. May we ditch judgmentalism, throw away condemnation, and learn how to celebrate the loving invitation of your kingdom. Amen. Now words of assurance of forgiveness. Ever loving God, you call us into your family of grace. Where we have been lost, you seek us. You retrieve us, you untangle us from the thorns that snare us. Your hands are kind. You restore us with joy. Thank you for not only accepting us, but celebrating us, delighting in us as we discover what it means to belong to you. Amen. Later on this morning, we'll be thinking about the shepherd, and so a prayer of thanksgiving based on shepherds. Lord, what do we mean when we say God is like a shepherd? A shepherd is rough and rugged, weather beaten from the wind and rain, but yet with a heart as gentle as the spring flowers. Thank you, tough and gentle God. What do we mean when we say God is like a shepherd? A shepherd is practically dressed and plain spoken, smells of the hillside mud and the lanolin oil of a fleece, down to earth, messy, incarnate. Thank you, God, for you come to us just where we are. What do we mean when we say God is like a shepherd? A shepherd must be a loner, striking out, comfortable with their own thought, intimately knowing every rock and every valley, yet longing for the company of others over a drink on their return. Thank you, comfortable, confident, and companionable God. What do we mean when we say God is like a shepherd? A shepherd is a teller of stories and a singer to the wind, wisdom ingrained in his hands that tend and heal. Thank you, inspiring and healing God. A shepherd has a job to do and gruffly protects the sheep, looking out for dangers of terrain, predators and disease, yet gently acts as midwife and nurse during the lambing in spring. Thank you, caring God. What do we mean when we say God is like a shepherd? A shepherd endlessly counts the sheep and knows each one. And when one is lost, searches and searches and searches again, returning with the sheep, safely carried in strong arms, stretched wide. Thank you, loving God. Amen. And we join now in saying the prayer that Jesus taught his first disciples by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, day 
if it should be lost. There are probably things you spent a few hours, even a few days searching for, but it would have to be an item of exceptional value to cause you to go on looking any longer than that. Unless, of course, it's your car keys <laughs> and you can't move without them. But if we change the word anything to anyone, the question becomes very different. For I expect each one of us, or more likely several people, so sorry, each one of us has someone, or probably several people, who we'd be willing, if necessary, to scour the planet for, should they ever become lost. A partner, a child, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, Few of us would rest until we have found them, if they were lost. And I want to add to that list, pets. Five weeks ago, um, when I was walking, uh, Maggie, who's a rescue dog, I've had her just 10 months now, it was nine months in, she got chased off the field near my house by one of a pack of dogs that were down there that I'm trying to avoid, and I lost her for nearly a quarter of an hour. I don't know if any of you have ever lost a cat or a dog and you just don't know where to start. I should have started at home, of course, because that's where she ran to. But when we're really searching for somebody or something, it gives us a powerful insight into the astonishing love that God has for each one of us. And our readings this morning focus on the parable about the three things that are lost. The images that Jesus uses to illustrate this amazing love include lost sheep and lost coin. But it's probably the story of the father and his two sons which get us closest to the mark. Speaking as it does of that special bond within a family which is able to withstand so much without breaking. That's the way God sees us as his family, his children. Each one of us is special enough for him to go on caring about our welfare, no matter how much we fail him, to carry on seeking us out, no matter how many times we go astray. We're going to sing again now. I think this song is more familiar than the other one to you. It's number 481. The Lord is my shepherd. Four eight one.
morning is taken from Luke, <clears throat> chapter 15, verses 1 to 7, the parable of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the Lord muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who, not need, who do not need to repent. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus was always getting it in the neck when he was seen to be associating with those in the community which the Pharisees thought of as sinful and unclean. He was often speaking about the needs of these people and the love of God for each one of them. Earlier, he had spoken about God's invitation to all people when he told the story of the banquet. Now we come to this series of parables or stories of lost things. Each one shows how God rejoices over the saving of one of his people. And so it's Jesus' passion to seek and save the lost. This attitude is illustrated by the willingness of a shepherd to go out over the hills, searching so that not even one sheep would be missing from his flock. There may well be shepherds who do actually say, what is one lost sheep? compared to the 99 in the fold, and they ignore the value of the individual, not so with God. No, he rejoices even more, if that's possible, over the return of the lost than over the safety of those at home. The parable of the lost sheep is familiar to many Christians. Often we interpret it from the experience of being the one that is lost, and found. It feels safe and reassuring to know that the shepherd, God, takes care of us. But if we turn this story round, what if it is us who are the shepherds or the owners of the flock being challenged to seek out the one who is lost? In many ways, this is the true definition of the parable because are we all called to be Jesus' hands and feet on earth? Who else then has the job of seeking out the lost? It may be that it is the forever complaining Pharisees who are the lost sheep. This would be a good example of those who seem to be listening, but just don't get the message. Back to the parable then. What was it, after all, about that one sheep that made the shepherd go after it? It probably wasn't the one with the woolliest coat. It probably wasn't the one that regularly nuzzled up close to the shepherd's knee. It wasn't the one with the almost human bleat. It was simply the one that was lost. No qualifications except a disqualification. No structure to its life, no good sense, no obedience. That's the one that got the right home on the shepherd's shoulders. That's the one that made the angels sing for joy. Okay, the sheep could say on the way home, I know I'm being saved because I'm riding on the shepherd's shoulders. But the gospel story, the gospel message, is not about the right home. It's about the shepherd's journey into the wilderness, a journey undertaken out of sheer love and completed with sheer joy. If this is what makes the whole company of heaven sing, then we must join in with that too. It seems foolish for the shepherd to leave the 99 sheep 
to go out for just one. But God's love for each individual is so great that he seeks each one out and rejoices when he or she is found. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the way you watch over us throughout our lives, the way that you continually guard and guide us, whatever we may face. When we wander far from your side, you don't abandon us to our fate, but instead you come looking for us, your love refusing to let us go. Though we forsake you, you never forsake us. Though we are sometimes faithless, you remain faithful. We praise you for that great truth. We ask for forgiveness for the areas in our life in which we continue to go astray. And we pray for help to follow you more closely in the days ahead. To the glory of your name. Amen. We sing again now, and the words are going to be up on the screen. How deep the Father's love for us. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son and make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon his cross my sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no will but I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom verses 8 to 10, the parable of the lost coin. 
Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. The fact that Luke has included this parable about a woman emphasises that the good news is for all people, including those society usually overlooks. Jesus uses an everyday example from domestic life. It's likely that there's a deeper significance to the silver coin. Perhaps it could have been a coin from the woman's headdress, her dowry, her only inheritance and security for the future. Palestinian women receive 10 silver coins as a wedding gift. These coins held sentimental value like that of a wedding ring, and to lose one was extremely distressing. No wonder she searches frantically for it. Luke gives this radical edge overturning society's expectations not only does he use a domestic example, he suggests that God is like a woman who sweeps out the house, looks for a coin, and invites her neighbours in to celebrate when she finds it. In just the same way, Luke implies the Pharisees should share in God's rejoicing over the salvation of the outcasts. We can perhaps imagine a God who will forgive sinners who crawl to him for mercy, but a God who searches for sinners, for those who have wandered away from him, then forgives them, must have extraordinary love. This is the kind of love that prompted Jesus to come to earth to search for lost people and save them. This is the kind of extraordinary love that God has for you. If you feel far away from God this morning, don't despair. He is searching for you right now. Stop running away. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, it's wonderful enough that when we were lost, you came and found us. It's more wonderful still that you continue to seek us out when we go astray again. That you go on looking for us day after day, year after year, for as long as it takes, as often as it's needed. No matter who we are or what we may have done, still we matter to you. Enough for you never to rest until we are restored to your side. Teach us to recognise the astonishing breadth of your love in faithful service and joyful praise. In your name we pray. Amen. And now Liz is going to bring the final story. Our reading is from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. The parable of the last son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen in that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? 
and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and have and kill it, and let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. God bless the reading of his book. The third parable makes the same point as the earlier two, this time at greater length. Its main character is really the Father, who, in effect, illustrates the character of God. The younger son used up all his inheritance, and then his desperate state brought him to repentance. He realised that not only had he made a real mess of his life, but also that he was unworthy to be called his father's son. He was fit only to be a servant and he was prepared to humble himself and seek re-entry to the home at that level. Before he reached home, however, his father was already looking for his arrival, and before he could blurt out the whole of his intended confession, his father had welcomed him back into the family circle, treated him with great honour, and given orders to celebrate the return of the one who had been as good as dead. The centre of attention of this parable remains the pardoning love of God, which should have shamed the Pharisees into positive response. Some people need to hit rock bottom in order to come to their senses. The son's attitude was based on a desire to be as free as he pleased, that's no different from the desires of most people in our world today. It may take great sorrow and tragedy to cause them to look up to the only one who can help them. In the two earlier stories, the seeker actively looked for the coin and the sheep who could not return by themselves. In this story, the father watched and waited. He was dealing with a human being with a will of his own, but he was ready should his son return. God's love is constant and waiting. He will search for us and give us opportunities to respond, but he doesn't force us to come to him. Like the father in the parable, he waits patiently for us to come to our senses. We can all get physically lost. We may have memories of being lost as a child. I got lost in Woolworths once. Those big, shiny, mahogany, curved counters were too high for me to see my granddad, but he saw me. People deliberately get lost when they just walk away from their homes, their families, their lives but don't usually want to be found. And there are those of us who momentarily lose sight of God, although these moments may last days or weeks. We could then be just considered to be like a boat without an anchor or a sailor without a compass. We lose sight of our guide. A shepherd doesn't wait for the lost sheep to come back. He goes looking for it. And so he is with Jesus. He is the messenger sent to us by the Father. He didn't wait for the lost to come looking for him. He went out of his way to look for them. And when he found them, he escorted them back to the Father's house with joy. 
Remember, to come back to God is to come home. Jesus is seeking the wanderers, yet why do they roam? Love and waits to forgive and forget. Home, weary wanderer, home. Let us pray. Loving God, we don't know why we go astray, for we don't want to. We yearn to live as your people, to offer faithful and committed service, but somehow we always fall short, temptation creeping upon us unawares, our old nature reasserting itself just when we believed it to be defeated. Loving God, we grieve over our weaknesses, overcome sometimes with frustration, even despair, at our inability to honour our calling in Christ, and we fear that finally, even your love will one day be exhausted. Our disobedience pushing your patience too far. Yet, just when all seems lost, you come again, reaching out your hands, lifting us up and carrying us safely home. Thank you for continuing to search for us. Amen. We sing again now, number 400. And 43. Come let us sing of a wonderful love, tender and true.
and the message of the gospel bring new beginnings, so that however low they might have fallen, they will know themselves forgiven, accepted and restored. May your light shine in the darkness, a beacon of hope and a lamp to their path. Father God, hear our prayer for all who seek help, guidance, healing and knowledge of belonging. May they find in you the answer to their prayer and the end of their wandering and searching. And in the silence of our hearts now, we lay before your altar those who are known personally to us, who need your open arms, your healing around them right now. And we particularly remember Phil, Kathy, Wendy, Esme.
to our new government as they face the challenges of our times and attempt to govern with equity and compassion. Loving Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and mouths to speak out words of peace and justice. In our own lives, where we're struggling because of health issues, physical or mental, where we're fearful of the cost of living crises and its effect upon us, where the impact of pressure and stress is often unseen and unnoticed by anyone else. Loving Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and mouths to speak out the words of peace and justice. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And our final hymn this morning is number 323. <coughs> I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Three, two, three.
Lord came to me as we sang in that last verse. Then he'll be any saviour everywhere the loved ones I shall meet. And we will meet our Queen, because surely she's there, shining with her. A different body, a healthy body. And we'll all be together, no matter our race, our creed, whatever on this earth. We now come to the, the blessing, but firstly, a prayer of dedication for the offertory, which will be taken as you leave. God of all creation, thank you for the wonderful things that you've made. Thank you for the universe full of stars and planets, for our world full of life. Take these gifts we offer you back to you. May they be used to the glory of your name. We offer you ourselves and all the gifts you've blessed us with. Take us and use us to share your love with the world. Amen. And our final prayer. God of the lost, open our eyes to see the world as you do. Forgive us when we fail to see the lost. Help us to look for those who need your love and give us the courage not only to offer them signs of your love, but by our actions and words to share your love with them. Amen. And now we bless each other as we share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and our